The Art of Being Ruled. Wyndham Lewis. Original Publication 1926. 1989 Edition. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Part 11. Proudhon and Rousseau. Chapter 6. Paul Leroy Bewley's Forecast of a Collectivist State, and a Pons Asinorum of Socialist Theory. At this point I will quote at length a passage from the excellent treatise of Paul Leroy Bewley, Le Collectivisum, combating in great detail this same system of centralized administration which was the bugbear of Proudhon, but which was the foundation of the doctrine of Marx. It is no exaggeration to say that the polemic of this hostile professor of political economy corresponds exactly to Proudhon's objections to the socialist as the archenemy, only the socialist, of all human beings, would, etc. In that passage he was envisaging the socialist in exactly the same way as Leroy Bewley does in the book from which I am about to quote. Leroy Bewley, beginning with definitions of the various sorts of socialism, proceeds to show how the collectivism of Marx cum Collins would result in a new feudal system far more rigorous than that of feudal Europe. The fundamental question of the division of labor, that division dominating all contemporary production, is carefully examined. But this division results, as he shows, in the direction and administration of our enterprises falling to an administrative class. That this must ultimately be in the nature of a caste, and that in a collectivist state it would inevitably assume the form of an hereditary caste, is again inevitable. For administration requires different faculties to manual work, and the habit of administrative command, the technique of the functionary, cannot be learnt too young. Supposing the intellectual and moral qualities to be exactly the same, the son of the head of a business will be much more likely to become a good businessman than the son of a workman. He instances the marvelous business aptitude of the Jews to support this. So the separation of these two categories of functions, the one intellectual and administrative, the other specifically manual and subordinate, would not disappear, because this separation is of the essence of great-scale industry. In a collectivist state a workman could come to be a mental worker and be promoted to be an administrative official, it is true, as happens at present. But compared to the great mass of workers, the director and the administrators would always necessarily be few in number. Elected or appointed, the members of the administrative committees would form naturally a concentrated authority and the generality of the workers would be as they are today, or more so, subordinate. So when manual workers are promised under a collectivist regime the direction of their respective industries, they are being deceived. It is the same with the promise of the ownership of tools. The tools would belong to the collectivity. But what would this abstraction, the collectivity, really signify? It would mean, of course, a functionary who kept and distributed the tools. Just as today, the workman, addresses himself to his master to have the use, of his moyen du travail, he would then be obliged to address himself to the collectivity. But who is the collectivity? It is a reasoning being who, in effect, would take the form of this or that functionary. He would be obliged to solicit of this functionary the use of his tools, in other words, he would be absolutely at the discretion of his, new, masters. Imagine, for instance, the mayor of a commune having in his hands the direction and distribution of all the work done in his commune not only the municipal work on the roads, schools, and other public institutions, but all the domestic or private work, the tillage, pasturage, the building or repairing of private houses, the trade of the locksmith, carpentry, weaving, tailoring, everything down to the most insignificant occupations. It would be this functionary, the mayor or his deputy or some person of that kind, that every workman would have to go to each month, or week, or every morning, to ask for his tools, which belong to the collectivity, and for the material or land which had to be worked, and also the remuneration for his work. Today, if he is sent about his business by a capitalist master, the workman can go and look for another master. If the trade he has chosen becomes too unprofitable, he can, if the worst comes to the worst, abandon it and choose another. If where he lives he is not popular and no one will employ him, he is free to go somewhere else, to a neighboring or a more distant township or commune. In the collectivist system, the workmen would have to deal with nothing but officials, these would have in their possession all the tools and all the material, all the various branches of human production, and all the remuneration. These functionaries, to use a happy word of Fourier's, would be veritable omniarchs, that is to say, despots to a degree and on a scale of which humanity has up till now had no experience. They would not have the right, you will say, to refuse work and remuneration to anybody placed under their jurisdiction. That may be true, but what conditions might not be imposed relative to this work, as payment for this remuneration? With what insults might it not be accompanied? There will be, you may reply, higher authorities to whom appeal could be made. Imagine as you will adjustments without number, and of the most ingenious description, you will never get anything but a man who has to borrow from the community, that is to say, from officials, 
his tools to work with, a man who will not have choice of several masters, a man unable to change his trade, or his place of residence, without a permit. And you cannot alter the fact that this man will be infinitely more of a slave and more dependent than the serf of the Middle Ages. The latter at least possessed, on terms fixed by inviolable habit, the instrument of his labor, namely the earth. As to the position of the workman in society, collectivism would not make the workman independent or autonomous, the rejection by the adepts of collectivism of the periodic sharing out precludes that. No more than today would the workman own his tools, no more than today would he direct the business for which he worked. As to the election to the committees of management, again it would be the same thing. Most collectivists do not seem to like very much the idea of representative government. Once the change to socialism has been effected, says Scaffold, universal suffrage is not at all necessary. No doubt, during the period of transition, while the battle with liberalism is in progress, socialism will not drop universal suffrage. Again Scaffold speaks, not in a very cheering way for the poor unemancipated wage slave, of the future of individual liberty, the free choice of domicile, industrial liberty, perhaps being retained. More decided than this on the subject of the retention of all these liberal and democratic liberties, Scaffold, this great collectivist authority, cannot be. Perhaps it might be possible to preserve a little liberty in the new collectivist system, but not much. But Scaffold's politeness where these ancient liberties are concerned is a matter of form only, for they are all absolutely contrary to the working of the system that he is advocating. So, from the point of view of liberty and independence, the workman has nothing to gain from collectivism, it is, indeed, exactly the contrary. Collectivism would generalize, or rather universalize, what we are agreed on as constituting an evil, namely, the separation of man from the tools and material which are necessary to his existence. Yet how bitter is the criticism that collectivism brings to bear on the existing capitalist society, which it is yet so powerless to improve on. One contrasts collectivism with capitalism, collectivist society with capitalist society. This, Professor Leroy Bewley says, is absurd, for they are in fact almost one and the same thing. And this is the general form that the contention of the opponents of revolution takes. And yet this description of Leroy Bewley's is almost exactly what Proudhon would think of the matter, as I said to start with either as anarchist or federalist. If you have absorbed the criticism of Leroy Bewley contained in La Collectivisme and that of Proudhon scattered all over his works, but found at its best in La Capacité Politique des Classes Ouvriers, and if you are still unconvinced, then nothing can shake you. You can then consider yourself as possessing the equivalent of a diploma as a centralist or aetatiste. You will then be definitely on the Marxian side of the fence. To be at all an intelligent socialist that problem is the first and most fundamental one. It is elementary, a pons asinorum of socialist theory. But it is often not properly mastered. If you are a little Marxian, you must meet the dragon called Proudhon, or, if you like, Leroy Bewley, and withstand successfully their full assault, following all their objections out to the fullest extent and most despotic consequences. And if you are a little Proudhonian, you must dispose of that pampered monster, that colossal bulk of venom and vanity, Marks.